Welcome to the Building Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Austin Tunnell, and today I get to share a conversation I had with Kobe Lefkowitz, and I'm really excited to share this conversation. Kobe is a really fun person to talk to. He is a writer, he is an urbanist, he is an infill developer, and he is a consultant and all-around optimist. I actually uh, discovered him on Twitter, I think, uh, maybe a couple years ago, now X, and uh, followed him. And I would recommend anyone that if you're on X, give give Kobe a follow. Um, but we get into here, we, we, we talk about, we, we don't talk very much about development and the technical aspects around that. We're going to do that on a podcast later this year. Here, we really focus on the culture around building well and all the things in the way of building well. But it's not um, a negative message. It's also a very optimistic message because Kobe and I both share this idea that in a lot of ways, the best is just yet ahead if, if we can get our beliefs right, if we can just start working together a bit more and having more conversations um, because we're both so encouraged by how many people out there are doing great work. Um, and, and so it's fun to have this kind of tight knit group of people and Kobe and I have never talked actually on the phone before, but it felt like I've, you know, known Kobe longer than I really have. So really enjoyed having him on. I encourage you to give him a follow either on X and he's also got a website, uh, Kobe He's got some great writing on there. Um, so hope you enjoy, leave a comment about what you think, like, subscribe and share. It's really helpful for us and enjoy. Welcome, Kobe. It is good to have you on the podcast. Austin, thanks so much for having me, man. It's a real pleasure to get to sit down and talk with you. Yeah, I've been excited. Uh, I've followed you on Twitter, now X for a while. Um, and your, uh, it, it was when I, I realized you weren't just writing, which you're a writer, you know, you're, you're writing about urbanism and, and not just urbanism, you're writing about people and dreaming and vision. How do we create the best world? And yeah. so I, I really love that. And then you're also out there doing things and being a small developer and doing work. And that's really hard to do. And, and the, the combination of doing and thinking and like philosophizing about it, you could say, um, in a very optimistic way, uh, is really, really cool. So I'm glad to be on with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk to me a little bit about like, where uh actually just give give a little bit of your background of how you came to be from what you're doing now to just you know whatever makes sense for you to say about how you came to this place and even shaped your thinking about all of this because it's, it's 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 really unique yeah and, and happy to dive into any of those different aspects and components um I, i'd start by saying i'm trained as an urban planner but i i went into architecture school knowing i wanted to be a developer um Understanding you can always learn the financial side of development afterwards, but it's difficult to be imbued into the more creative milieu that you get in an architecture program, right? It's, uh, you can always learn the numbers. You can't always learn design. Uh, and now maybe there's an argument to be said. You can learn through observation. We can go to our favorite cities, towns, neighborhoods, blocks, and say, I like that. I want to do more of that, certainly. Uh, but it was a, a little bit more tangible education. So always knew I wanted to be a developer, but I, I also really wanted to be able to marry the softer, more qualitative components of it and, and not just think about the numbers and the models and, and how do we get the highest return possible. And through this journey, I, I worked for a, a large institutional REIT, so understood how the, the public markets work and, and institutional imperatives. I worked for a small developer a more boutique development firm in Brooklyn, where I got my hands dirty with a lot of different stuff. And ultimately now with Backyard, we develop our own small scale info projects. Um, so I've, I've been able to run the spectrum of, of what it looks like at a developer and, and looking through different asset classes and, and different markets and, and different sorts of projects. Um, but where that, that ties in with some of the writing and some of my other, let's say, philosophical uh, underpinnings are I was always interested in how cities came to be and trying to understand why our world looks the way it does. You can open up a zoning map or a zoning text and say, okay, I, I see that 50% of the neighborhood is single family, maybe RS1, and we have a commercial corridor uh, that's running through the spine of it. And uh, that's where we're going to get our on our strode, let's say, that has become 
you know, popular in, in common parlance. We're, we're going to have our Arby's, we'll have our Chick-fil-A's, our Walmarts along it. And, and maybe in these parts of the city, we'll have office parks and so on and so forth. And so you can read a city that way, but how do you really understand how it comes to be? And part of you know, my, my background as a planner, as a developer, was always seeing how these two disciplines were in dialogue with one another, but weren't always gelling. So I really have, have sought to explore the intersection of development and planning and not just to say, well, you're going to get uh, a building with 40% lot coverage and 25 parking spaces because you wanted to design X instead of Y, but to say, how do we mold these two incredibly important disciplines in the service of creating more beautiful places? Because I think if you're, if you're interested in the built environment at all and cities and towns, you probably have a pretty, uh, a pretty strong perspective on the things that you like and the things that you don't like. And uh, sometimes it's very difficult to understand how you get from A to maybe Z and, you know, all points in between. Absolutely. And, and when you were describing even like, oh, this road, and then you got the Chick-fil-A and then the, the things and the office and the subdivision off, it just, even as you're saying it, like, it just reminds me of like, yeah, you're, when you're describing that, it sounds like you're describing the ingredients of say a pie. <laughs> but not a pie, you know, right. versus the city, you know, the, and that's how I, I think about our cities. The, the recipe is the planning, the urbanism, the ingredients are the buildings and you need both to have a good meal. If you've got great, great recipe, Absolutely. crappy ingredients going to be a mediocre meal and vice versa. Although I would actually argue that the urbanism <clears throat> and the, the recipe is more important than the ingredients to an extent in that. Totally agree. Yeah, like you can always replace a building later and I'm all about building for 500 years. But I mean, <laughs> I would once you get the urbanism set, it's just so hard to change. It's so, so, so hard to change. Um, yeah. But yeah. The, the, the one point I make that depending on what circle I'm in, uh, whether I'm talking to, <laughs> it, it might be received differently. So urbanists receive it well, traditionalists and classicists don't. Um, even though I, I have strong affinities to all these disparate groups, is if you look at a city like Tokyo or Athens, objectively, the architecture is not very good in those cities. There's yeah. great examples. Obviously, we, we can talk about uh, the birthplace of, of Western architecture is in Athens. So you, you have that incredible heritage. But if you walk around Piraeus or in, in some of the core areas of Athens, they're just concrete blocks. And if you walk around the, the lanes of Tokyo, they're very hastily or seemingly hastily constructed buildings, uh, not very high quality materials. They might not have a uniformity that you might want to see in other cities, but those are some of the most attractive places in the world because they get everything else right. The streets mm -hmm. are rather narrow. The buildings are fine grained. They're built at a human scale. The, there's so much vibrancy and energy. And so, you know, you, you can say, at any time in the future, you can come and build a beautiful building culture structure, right? And, but fundamentally, you don't need that to be a good place. That just elevates it to the sublime, right? When, yeah. when you're walking around somewhere like Venice or Rome or Paris or Amsterdam, Kyoto, any of these cities that have tremendous architecture, you feel as though you're in the, the province of the divine, but you can still be in the, you know, the realm of man in a very good right. way uh, uh, without that quality of architecture. So I, I, I totally agree. Dude, there's not so many people that say elevate it to the sublime. But like, I love it because that's, that's literally how I think about it. Um, you know, and actually, I, I want to read a, 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 something you've written in your, I think it was the beautiful, one of your posts. I forget what it was called. Um, but you say, my goal is to create more beautiful, walkable, and human places for everyone to live in. Despite the cynicism that's far too commonplace today, I believe that it's not only possible to solve the challenges our world faces, but that we can do so in an aspirational uh, do so in aspirational ways that allow us to create the world so many of us dream about living in. We don't have to settle for utilitarian, dreary, and unacceptable outcomes. All we have to do is be thoughtful and be unafraid, unafraid to dream. And it's like, I love that entire paragraph I just wrote, but like that last part, unafraid to dream, like that's where we should start. Yeah. Um, and it seems like no one's willing to, well, I don't mean no one, right? Like I'm kind of speaking in generalities. There's some amazing people out there doing amazing work, which you're very good at pointing out. But largely speaking, it seems like we're kind of 
stuck and like inability to dream and see outside what just exists. Do you like, yeah. what is your thought about that? The, the why? And do you run into that yourself of people not being able to dream? And how do you talk to them? Yeah, it's a, a really good question because I, I think if you don't operate within the built environment, let's say you're not a developer, a planner, an architect, <clears throat> you might not be familiar with a lot of the compromises uh, that have to be made in order to get anything built. So a lot of our current development patterns and practices are very cost intensive. And when a lot of money is involved, there's a lot of risk involved. And if you need to raise a lot of money, and I, I know we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this later, it tends to be that institutions will, uh, will fund that. Um, necessarily, they have to be risk averse. Because if you are running in a pension fund for the public teachers in North Dakota, and you have 10,000 people who are relying on you for their social security payments, or not so rather their retirement payments, in addition to social security payments, then you can't uh, very well take these big risks that might not pay out. And so at conception, your, your dream of what a place can be is scaled back to the lowest common denominator. I know what the town next door built. That place is fully leased up. They built it for $200 a foot. Uh, if I follow this exact strategy, we have a vacancy rate under 5%. There will be people who will move and live there. I'm taking off as much risk from the table as possible. So I think that's that's part of it. Um, a, you, that's a, a, a great simplification of that process. But it's a very complex process to interrogate. And so it's difficult to have that conversation with most people wondering why we can't dream. It it then reduces to something simple, which I think is is part of the answer as well, which is um, in addition to being scared that your project might not be uh, financially successful, you might be scared that culturally it might not be accepted. So if, if you take a risk and you want to build something that is wholly novel or unique or has been done in a long time, and you spend countless years, a lot of money, but but more so on this side, it is your personal pride. You're putting your name on something. And to have that be spurned by the people that you care for the most, which would be the community that you're building in, right? Because we're building, we're community builders at the end of the day, and you want the things that you create to be accepted by those around you. That is a really strong imperative to just scale back the dreams and say, okay, I, I don't want to attract too much attention. I'm going to put my hood on, I'm going to keep my head down. And unfortunately, that has manifested in a built environment that is homogenous, where everything looks the same, and is a little bit sad because we're not getting those flourishes of, of beauty and wonder that risk takers in the past and artisans have been uh, willing to do. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think you're, I mean, you're spot on both of us being, uh, you would describe yourself as a small developer, right? That's the term, yeah. you know, or, you know, something that's what I am to, you know, sm well, partially small developer, among other things, it's not big guys get taken institutional money, that's right. kind of things. But um, you're, you're so right that once you're in the position of being the developer, and the one making the decisions, the one taking other people's money and signing on banknotes, like, the numbers have to work. Like I, I don't have the luxury of building something that's a failure because I go bankrupt if that happens. You know, that's like right. I don't, it, it's not, Oh, it didn't work this time. Great. You know, so we're, I always am having to, what I try to do, and I'm curious how you think about this. I try to let myself dream as big as absolutely possible. Like just, if I come up with a new idea and I come up, <laughs> Go out and do ideas daily. I feel like they're yeah. mostly bad ideas, but every once in a while, I'll do one. But uh, I try to like just take off all the barriers, let my mind go as far as I can take it. I try to write it down, and then and then it's you know let that stew in things. And sometimes you just swipe it off the list. But over time, it's more like okay, what's the next smallest step I can take towards this thing to test this out or whatever it is? It's not how do I swing and hit a home run. How do I hit a, a, a single or a double towards that goal? But I don't want to water down the goal. Because if I do, I won't even be, that's really my North star of where I'm heading. Yeah. Um, and then you have to come back to reality of dealing with the banks and the returns and the cultural risk, which I know exactly what you're talking about, because we're talking about that here of some of the stuff we want to do 
in Oklahoma, we're kind of like, is Oklahoma ready for that? You know, I, right. and I don't know the answer uh, in some ways. Um, but it's interesting that institution or money has just shaped so much of what gets built and how things get built. Like I call multifamily. That's really not a real estate project. That's a finance product. Absolutely. It's been figured out, you know, and yeah. I, I can actually appreciate that. I'm not really, I can say that in a bad way, but I can also mean that in like a, I mean, it, they're really quite sophisticated about how they're, they're, they're understood. You pull the trigger and I didn't even know this, but like you, they just have crews flying around the country doing it. It's not like they might use a local plumber electrician, but they've just got framers that come and fly in. They put it up in two months and they go to the next one because yeah. they're just so good at it. And this bring cost down is really efficient. But it's not human, you know. It's not human at the end of the day. No, and, and you can't that you can't afford uh, to dream when you have those level of efficiencies that you're trying to pin down. And it those efficiencies matter because we can we can sit here and say, well, the new I won't name any firms, but we know them. Home Builder X or Home Builder Y, <clears throat> who built this community outside of Dallas or this one outside of Tallahassee or this one in. Uh, Riverside, California, wherever it might be, um, is delivering dreary projects, right? But because of their efficiencies where they can save 20 or $30 a square foot, that means that a first-time homeowner, it, it might be an hour away from a city. And so we, we don't want to encourage ex, ex-urban sprawl, not only suburban sprawl, but they can afford a home for $350,000. And it's very difficult to make the argument um, that we shouldn't care about cost to an extent um, because we need to deliver affordable homes for people. And I, I'm very sympathetic to that argument. I think there are ways that we can achieve efficiencies on cost where we still can create great places. You know, instead of this community being an hour outside of the core city on a greenfield site where you're, you're having to build the roads, you're having to build the sewer and water and power or stubbing the power lines, right? You're, you're building all this infrastructure, you're clearing, gridding land. You can save a lot of those uh, horizontal costs by doing an infill site, so long as it's, it's zoned for the type of project that you want to do. Now, it's difficult for these large institutions to get the economies of scale in an existing city to build those sorts of projects. It's, it's a lot easier out in the suburbs, but you can take those costs and similar to what we were saying about the urban design and, and the planning almost coming first and architecture right behind it, not, not so far behind it is so long as you say, hey, look, no front setbacks requirements. If you want to do it fine, it might be a little quirk, but if you don't mandate people provide front setbacks, they probably won't do it because you're going to want to take up more of your lot. If you can no side setbacks, streets are going to be rather narrow. All, all of these good components of urban design, the buildings can just be, boxes you know they can be masonry they can be wood frame they can be any number of things concrete um and the buildings don't have to be that ornate but throw a couple of shutters on maybe have some decorative uh, or, or ornamental brickwork and now suddenly you can create a product that's cost effective to what these large institutions are building and it's more sustainable and it's more walk one it's all these things that we want but there has to be a real deep interrogation of those processes at the beginning. And uh, unfortunately, our current development patterns privilege this lowest common denominator, fly, fly over a metropolitan area and say, all right, those are 200 acres that look proximate to the Walmart and to the highways that can get me downtown. So looks good enough. Right? And, and there's obviously more complex demographic studies that go into this process. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun, it requires a fundamental rethinking of the inputs even before you get to the buildings. Uh, it's it's interesting you talking about I, I think you make a great point about costs like we can't make everything um a mansion or or luxury yeah. you know and that actually kind of annoys me about marketing today is like everything is freaking luxury like oh I my hate God. the word luxury because it's, hate it means it. absolutely nothing um and and then also I don't really love it because I don't know well I, I I'm like I, I'm happy with good <laughs> you know why can't something just be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Good is great. Good is great. You know, like, uh, but but the cost. You know, we almost need a we we as efficient and smart and knowledgeable as we are as a society. It's also 
it's easy to say that house is cheap because it's three hundred thousand dollars and i can afford it as an individual this year and maybe for the right. next few years but if you start looking at that cost over time and i don't mean just five or ten years i really mean probably more like between the 50 and 100 year range yeah as the house the, a single family detached house that's not really super well built because it is cheap, how quickly it's going to degrade and how expensive that maintenance is going to actually be to keep it up. And then the infrastructure, all that costs to do this super low density stuff. It's all great because it's all new and people have paid for it. But after that initial capital and the developer is gone and no one's there to make money, like people are just going to be stuck with it yeah. with a whole lot of money to, to, to make it not better, just to keep it going. And it's not going to be cheaper. It's going to be way more expensive, at least and who knows who's going to foot the bill for that, whether that's going to be the homeowners or the taxpayers or the business or the combination of everyone. But I do what kind of like you have the carbon stuff or people, you know, over time, they'll do the, what, you know, the, the life cycle of carbon. I'm a lot. Well, I would be really interested in the life cycle of just like cost, the sustainability of our costs of different types of things. Um, but that's just kind of a, a comment. <laughs> have you seen anything like that of people doing um, studies or, or anything like that? I cut out for half a second there. Could you just repeat the last bit? Sorry about that. Oh, awesome. yeah, yeah. No, no. I was, have you uh, uh, ever run across anyone doing any kind of cost analysis about the cost <clears throat> over time of different types of development patterns, you know, kind of born by a society? So, for example, if you live in the suburbs, you're an hour and away. You're probably going to have to own two cars to even do anything to get to work. Right. Maybe if you're in New York, it's different. I don't know. But like here, you would have to own two cars. And if you've got teenagers, you probably need a third and a fourth one. That's and right. That's extraordinarily expensive. So while your house payment sounds low, what are the maintenance costs of that house? What are the costs of your cars? And then once again, what are the costs of the all the infrastructure that goes in to support that? But it's really you can't see that. Yeah, the, the two groups that jump out, which I, I know you're familiar with, uh, and I think a lot of urbanists are, admire them greatly, are, are strong towns and urban three who have yeah, done the, the ones in my mind, yeah. Right, the, the the value per acre analyses, and those are terrific. That's more from a a tax revenue perspective. So I don't know if somebody's amortized the cost of a new subdivision and compared that to an infill development. Right. It's the difficult thing about doing that is that there are so many different stakeholders in the <clears throat> in the larger exurban or even suburban tract home development. Because it's it's not just the locality or the municipality, it's the state's roads who are doing that. It's it might, There might be a county engineer. There might be a, a city engineer. There might be, uh, you know, when you're a master developer, you do all the horizontal costs and you plot out all of the sites. But then there are individual home builders who are brought in. And sometimes they're one and the same, but but in a lot of projects, they're not. And so you have so many different stakeholders, which makes it difficult to disintermediate these costs. But I'd be fascinated because it's it is true that it, at least from an individual's perspective, it's it's true that it it's, may not be cheaper to live in an exurban home an hour outside of Dallas than it is in New York City. And people might say that's crazy because a, a one bedroom apartment in Manhattan is going to be seven hundred thousand dollars in most neighborhoods, and you can get a five bedroom, three car garage outside of Dallas for four hundred thousand dollars, right? But um, if you maybe you compare it to the mortgage payment or the rental payment, if you have three or four cars and you're making $200, $300 lease payments a month, and each of those cars is taking a couple hundred dollars in gas a month and insurance and repairs and, and all of these things, it may well be competitive in cost. So I think that's, I would, I would be very fascinated to see that broken down analysis as well. And then the, the other part to, to, to the first part of what you were saying, there is a unfortunate cultural component to this conversation that is unaddressed that Americans just love stuff that's new. You know, yeah. we, and we've become used to this planned obsolescence. So I buy a home in this subdivision and it's a 10 year vintage and I've lived here for five years, but there's a new community that opened up down the street and the homes are a hundred square feet larger and they've got a better pool house and community house. And the price is only twenty thousand dollars more. So I'm going to move on to that next thing. And it's that in and of itself is fine. It would be fine if, if you know, that was in a city proper. 
and people should move as, as frequently as they want. And they should move, you know, we're, we're liberated to have this freedom right. of movement around the world today, which is terrific. But if the underpinning foundations that are uh, required for you to do that every couple of years, or maybe every decade or two decades, are built on sand, uh, that's not something we can rely on. You know, it's, it's, there's only so much land to go before you hit the edge of uh, an urban area and you're not going to commute an hour and a half to get to downtown Phoenix. So right. the drive till you qualify only works so far. You know, it, right. it's, it's, it doesn't work at scale. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't, it gets to a certain scale and people say, great, the Phoenix metro area grew to 5 million people. Where do you grow beyond that? Because you don't have any water. You don't have any, the, the, oh. the required resources to maintain the roads when it's 115 degrees and the asphalt is starting to melt and the pipes underneath are corroding. Like that's difficult, right? But if, if you concentrated the 10,000 people who might live across 10,000 acres, uh, each on their acre large lot on two or three, uh, two or three is, is tight on uh, a square mile, which is, you know, 600 acres, uh, 640, you can realize a lot of those efficiencies. But that's a cultural difference that I worry we're going to have to wait until the barbarians are at the gates. And then we say, no, 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 no we, we need to build the gates higher. It's like, well, no, we, we had to do that 20 years ago. We, we can't do it now. No, you, you man, yeah, that's, that's, uh, it, it's like we treat our, that's the thing, like we think of them as houses. Like, we think of where we live as the house, like the yeah. thing, because we can buy it and we can consume it and we can sell it and it could be our investment or whatever it is. And there is a piece of that. I'm not saying that's bad. I think, you know, I thought about my house and in, in, in parts in that way. Um, but like, we really think of our house as if there's something we consume and it's like, no, this is supposed to be a place that we live. Um, and that supports our lifestyle and our living and who we are as human beings and relationships. Um, and then hopefully also it's a good investment, but like, yeah. And I've noticed that in myself, like the more I'm becoming aware of it, I, I even notice myself taking a consumption mentality to, to think kind of like a throwaway mentality to stuff. And I'm really mm -hmm. like working on a little bit, like just trying to take a little bit better care, buying fewer things, buying yeah. better things, and then buy, taking more care of them, better care of them. And that's kind of a new thing for me that I'm really trying in my personal life outside of just, you know, buildings or cars or something. But whether it's clothes or a wallet or a belt or shoes or, you know, whatever it is, um, a meal. Um, but, but you're right. It, it comes down to culture. And I think that's one of the reasons I've just um, drawn to how you talk because you really are. And, and this is how I think, too. But you're, you're, you're blending this idea of, like, how do you bring these different worlds together, this world of kind of the, the artist and this reaching for the sublime. and yeah questioning what it means to be human and what does human flourishing mean and how can we bring why can't why should the vision not be to bring that into everyday lives for everyone like and to be able to hold that and then also over here see the reality of the world and how it works and not even say that's necessarily bad there's a lot of amazing like just unbelievable things about how the world works and how the world that we live in today and that we're sitting here having this conversation right now and you know just just the banking system is just phenomenal to me that I can just go to any random, I can move to New York, go to a bank and assuming I qualified, I could go buy a loan, like buy a house with hundreds of thousands of dollars from people yeah. I've never met before. I mean, that, that's pretty wild, but like, you know, you, you talk about too, the pet, like the, the, you've got zoning and, and cars are, are such huge problems. Those are the two of the, probably the biggest, I guess, physical barriers in a lot of ways, but you can solve both of those. Get rid of exclusionary zoning, get rid of parking minimums. Are we suddenly going to have some beautiful flourishing society? No, no, we won't. That's actually just step one, like, or just one of the steps because it really is this cultural thing and this belief. And that's where I was getting back to the dreaming part because it's not just on the developers and the city planners to dream. It's also like individuals, like what kind of life do I want? And, and I'm realizing I don't question that enough. And, and I don't think other people question that enough either. Yeah, it, it's, it's so well said. Uh, I, well, I think questioning certain components of life can lead to existential thought that a lot of people <laughs> want to do away with. And, and so it's easier not to do it and just to follow the, the, the templated path before you. I, I certainly sympathize with that. But um, I, so, something in, in the topics of city building and planning and development that I, I do get a little frustrated with, with a lot of urbanists. And I'm, I'm sure if, if people don't read my writing or they don't 
maybe listen to podcasts, they probably assume similar things of me because I, I love to dumb myself down. It's important, not, not because the audience is, <clears throat> is dumb or, or can't grasp right. concepts, but I can't scale an idea if I say, here's 3,000 words on this small uh, component of, of code. And here's yeah. why you should care about it, right? <clears throat> there are people who have made that their career and that's terrific, but it's, and, and now it's kind of bubbled to the surface. And so when I say pretty building good, build more pretty building, you know, it's very simple. And so I, I understand that uh, there may be people who look to me and say, hey, you're kind of making this out to something that it shouldn't be. But there are a lot of people who say, to your point, if we just solve zoning, if we just solve parking minimums, if we just solve car dependency, this, that, and the other, uh, that will be the silver bullet. We will arrive at Valhalla. We will arrive where, where we want to be. And it is true that if you solve for zoning and you solve for car dependency, you'll get part of the way there. Now, single stair uh, and point access blocks are being talked about in a lot of urbanist circles. Sure, that will help a little bit as well. There, there's all these things on the margins that will help, um, but they have to be marching towards a coherent vision. And, and, and before that, that vision point, you know, the financing is essential. You're going through this now, I, I'm going through this now, Every other small developer would probably be nodding their head. They're going through it as well. It is almost impossible for small developers to get financing. We don't have the capacity to uh, oftentimes issue the personal guarantees that we need to get construction loans. So we have to bring in partners and manage those relationships. And there's all these difficulties that a lot of planners and designers and activists don't necessarily see because they're not having those conversations. That's maybe even a bigger issue than uh, not car dependency, not zoning, but it's it's really, really close because you can't actually get things built that you want if you don't have the financing. Anyway, all of these components, 10, 12, 15 different things that need to come together um, that on their own will solve some issues, but not be silver bullets, have to be marching into a coherent direction. And if you're not, you're going to get places that feel a little dis, you know, disoriented. Or, or confused, right? Where um, there, there are a lot of places in the world that have good urban bones. There are a lot of places in the world that have good buildings um, and they are not successful. They, they're, maybe their populations have diminished by 90% over the last 60 or 70 years. Maybe the, the workforce has, has left and, and maybe you have uh, ghost towns entirely, right? So, so demographics tell a big story here as well. But I, I think communities around the country have to figure out what the story is for them. And they have to bring all these disparate components together and be okay with, uh, or not even okay, but be, be able to weave that narrative. And I, I think that arc of story building has been removed from the city building process for, for some time. That's a good, I, I, I like that. The, the arc of storytelling, you're right. Like if you talk to, and this isn't to knock on the peop, the individuals within the city or the system or whatever it is, but because it's not like they as individuals could come up with a vision and be like, this is the vision, you know, but, but like yeah. there isn't exactly that. Like there is not an actually coherent vision. And I mean, there's a lot of cities working on it. Oklahoma City's working on a plan of KC and stuff. And, you know, there's some really great things about that. And there's some things that I critique too there, but like you're right, it has to start with a vision. Otherwise it's kind of like, I, what, what are you doing just this for? Implement, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like arbitrary plans and you might as well start referring to things as, oh, another housing subdivision you mean more sleeping facilities you know storage <laughs> units right. for humans yeah um oh another office park you mean oh like another label labor extraction facility great that's right you know um <laughs> and, I, and I, i'm being a little tongue-in-cheek there but at the same time if you just like actually look at it does it really sound absurd like you know it doesn't actually sound if you're looking at what i'm talking about like it's not actually that absurd to talk to, to call it that you know, it is no, pretty it, inhuman. it's pretty inhuman yeah there's a reduction uh of these elements to their lowest component parts and, and right. it is it's true i mean that that's I, I think that if you were to take an alien and they were to describe the landscape of a uh, euclidean zoned community versus a mixed-use neighborhood they in reading their descriptions 
you would think that they were describing two different worlds, right? They, they might say for, the, for sprawl, these are living facilities, these are that. But it's not as easy to understand that when you're moving through a city because you have density and vibrancy and it. it's, it's much more of a, a comprehensive habitat. Um, and it's, it's funny on, on the, you know, the plan OKC or, or any of these comprehensive plans that communities put together, they are vision statements. And I've read my fair share in, in my life of, of any number of communities saying, you know, comp plan 2050, how we're going to move forward tomorrow. And I think just as it's dangerous to move forward without a vision, it's dangerous to move forward with a vision without really understanding how you're going to effectuate it. And they, these are sort of just empty mission statements. And so you have both ends of the spectrum and you, you have to bring them together. And, you know, I'll, I'll read some comp plans and they'll say all the right buzzwords. We want affordable housing. We want sustainability. We want X, Y, and Z. And then they'll say, okay, well, most of our city is still exclusively zoned for single family community, right? In most of our, our city, you uh, can only do X, Y, and Z in these places. And so you're... The, your goals are in direct conflict with the tools that you've set up to go out and build those goals. Mm -hmm. So it's, but I, I think a lot of times people don't quite understand this because if you are just a planner or you are just a marketing director or you're just a PR agent, you don't understand what the person on the other side is going through and saying, well, hold on a second, Austin, like these, these are great renderings you put together, but you, you don't get that. We can't, get this density of people if you don't allow for more multifamily housing next to this park that currently the single family homeowners would be. Or, hey, this is great that you want to have uh, become the city of poetry, but if you don't have any bookstores in, in, the, in the city or you don't have any libraries uh, and you're not, you don't have housing that's cheap enough for poets who many don't, uh, many aren't best-selling authors, right? They need to have a place in the city. How are you actually going to set these people up on the platforms that you want to grow? There is this cognitive dissonance between it. So you, you've got to wrap it all together. You really do. I almost can't help but think like uh, you need like in, in most cities, some kind of like develop design oriented, successful developer that could be like a, 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 a I don't know, like help people the city and stuff like not just because you're so right about the vision like i hear that a lot like people have ideas all the time like ideas are so cheap ideas are so cheap executions everything you know yeah it's funny because i just said you got to have the vision and i do believe that like you have but a lot of people don't even otherwise have the vision you're just too. doing random stuff but yeah. like just the vision it's like I, I remember steve jobs said this he was talking about john school when he took over or something he's like yeah he, he got this disease and i've seen other people get this disease and it's the disease that thinking an idea is 90% getting you 90% there. And he's like, the idea is, is maybe 10%. There's a lot of hard work and craftsmanship and making and remaking before you actually end up with a great product. And I'm like, yeah. yes, a thousand times yes. Because I don't know if you get this, but sometimes we'll get critique, you know, because we're not doing something perfectly by some other armchair urban planner or armchair designer or armchair architect or, arm, you know, whatever. Here's it's like, you have no idea the million things that we're having to deal with just to pull off this one house that, That's of course, right. is not perfect. I'm not telling, telling you it's perfect, you know, but it's hard. It's really hard. It's, it's totally right. And, and that's why I don't know if it would be a forum. I don't know if there's any <clears throat> thing with legislative heft that municipalities or, or states can put together. You, you see this in some respects for architectural review boards or historic preservation boards where <clears throat> they'll convene a, a series of experts and you, you can define expert in, in whatever way you want. It, it, sometimes that can be arbitrary. And they'll say, all right, if, if we just put these set people in, we'll, we'll get a good outcome. But oftentimes <clears throat> those people are all ideologically very similar and their their backgrounds are very similar. And so they're they're going to drive to a certain outcome. And that may not be the outcome that you want for your community but you've entrusted it into this small coterie of, of people who are going to you know, make, make decisions sometimes by fiat. So I wonder if there's a place for, you, you, get, you get the developer in the room, you get the architect, you get the planner, you get the engineer, and all of them are saying, hey, it's great that you want to do this, but X, Y, and Z. Here, here's something that you have to contest with. And maybe you have regular citizens in that conversation as well. I think you probably do. But until people can have an understanding of 
all of the different elements that go into uh, even building one home, they're not going to understand uh, the decisions that you made. They're not going to understand the final product. You know, they, they might say, hey, why did why did you can't deliver this in that way? Or, or why is the home, why does the yard feel so barren and vacant? It's like, well, we had to set it back 20 feet because not only is that in the zoning code, but the engineer said that if there's a car that was going over the speed limit and they needed to have a buffer between this and the house, so they didn't run into the house and, you know, kill the people inside. Like we need to set it out for all these reasons. And I think once you get everybody in the same room, exposing really what, what they have to deal with, I, I hope that common sense would prevail. Now that might be a a lot to ask of people in our world today. Common sense is not always prevail and common common sense is not always common. And it's you know, one person's perspective of what that is might be very different from somebody else's. But I think without these conversations, you know, I, I talk with a lot of planners, architects, developers, engineers. And so I, I try to educate myself and get different perspective. But it's very easy for small developers to just put our heads together and say, oh, this is these are the 25 ways they're screwing us. And then you have this group think and get into these echo chambers that do nothing other than uh, reify the current conditions. So you, yeah. you need to have this cross communication. I, I think, yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things you just do. So uh, or at least the way you talk about uh, very beautifully, because, you know, you, you're very optimistic and you're very positive, um, but you also don't shy away from critiquing things, which I think is really, really important because people that are like always optimistic all the time, it's like, guys, do you see what's happening out there? Yeah. But then also the people that are just like, it's all terrible. Blah, 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 and that gets exhausting too. And you really need this kind of like unshakable optimism and also like seeing the world for what it is. But I do love this idea of conversations because you even talked about on one of the podcasts I just heard some of, and I think you were advocating for, hey, when you're, you know, there's all these constituents. Uh, if you're a developer and you're going to a city to get something done, like there are so many people that you're talking to, to, to talk to that have their own very narrow and individual perspective. But just instead of rather than just coming in and just say, I'm trying to do this, I'm trying to do this, I'm trying to do this, which you are trying to do it, but it's also like trying to understand their perspective too. And like, what is their role and what are they supposed to be doing? Because once again, if you're talking to the parking engineer or, or something and you're trying to do something that's not in the codes, they're going to say, you can't do that. And right. you can get mad, but they're not necessarily. Now there's different ways for them to say no, right? Like, but like, they're, everyone's trying and I think you're right that it is these conversations and like having more, it's going to be a long time. This isn't going to be something that just happens very quickly. Um, but you said something earlier too that caught, that's just reminding here as we say this as it is, it is such a conversation and larger cultural thing because you mentioned Americans really like shiny new stuff. And that's true. Like it is, and it goes for me too. Like I'm realizing some of these things are true, you know, like where you're like, ah, oh, crap, I, you know, I fall into the exact same category. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but training or, you know, becoming aware of it. Uh, and if we're always addicted, you know, I almost think about kind of that newness as is almost a dopamine hit. And I don't know how much you know about dopamine. It sounds like weird that I'm talking about it, but I listen Please. to Andrew Huberman podcast and, yeah. and like, how the brain works and our chemicals and all that. And it's like, wow, okay. You know, the human body is not meant to be in a perpetual state of excitement because excitement and stress have very phys similar physiological effects. So being excited mm. all the time, you would die fairly quickly. Um, yeah. The heart can't but, pump that fast for that long. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. It really can't. You only have so many beats in your heart. Um, but he talks about like this idea of doping, which is kind of this feel good thing. Like if you, if I'm sitting here and I decide I want a cheeseburger, my dopamine spikes as I think about the cheeseburger, but then it starts going down and that's what motivates me to go get the cheeseburger. So as I start, you know, whatever, going through the process of getting my car and driving, like my dopamine starts going up and then it reaches its peak when I get that dopamine and then it crashes below baseline because however kind of like fast and high the spike is, that's how fast and low the trough will be. And it's inevitable. Right. You can't, no matter what. And that's why drugs are so dangerous and certain drugs like meth, because it's, it's something like a 10,000% spike and then just plummets. I mean, I yeah. can't even imagine because like you can, they can measure coffee and things and, and you're like, oh, it makes sense. But the newness of stuff, it reminds me of just that you literally get a dopamine hit from buying something new. The reason the endless That's screens right. on TikTok and stuff are literally so addictive is dopamine. Like you're just, it's endless. There's no end to it. There's no like, okay, I finished it. Let me put it down. It's just yeah. one more.
when more and there is this kind of just small dopamine that happens and you know and i think we just get kind of addicted to that as a society and we don't realize it we need to have those kind of conversations because if the citizens are demanding the new thing what are the elected officials supposed to do what are the experts supposed to do <laughs> you know, like, and they're humans too so they're they're prone to the same desires and and right, yeah. same as you I, i'm not uh, above it at all I, I am fully aware of of my predisposition predispositions and predilections and and they're they're that as well you know you get a new phone it's the greatest thing in the world it's the same exact thing as your last phone there really have not been any material differences and yet you're you're staring at it you know like it's the the holiest thing that's come to man <laughs> um and yours in all of it but um yeah, you know, it's it's brings up a something that I've talked through with preservationists. And I, I when I was younger, I had very strong and I still do very strong preservationist leanings. Um, and I think it's because all of the old stuff tended to be really good and a lot of the new stuff tended to be bad. So my perspective was we need to cherish that's what's old. And especially when you learn about the history of urban renewal and uh pre-modern preservation movements, we demolished some of the most remarkable structures that humanity has ever created uh, pretty arbitrarily. It was capricious, you know, and, and there were reasons that people could ascribe to them, but read read the history of Robert Moses in New York or Ed Logue in, in New Haven. You know, there, there's there's all, all these number of, of people who just took highways and ran them through cities uh, all across the country. University of Richmond is a very good, well, very sad, but series of maps that show before and after urban renewal. And so I had these strong leanings because I said, well, if we could, the past was so great and you romanticize it. But it's also the case that if you go to a historic community that hasn't evolved and everything is a house museum and people are playing dress up like it's the 18th century, that's not necessarily an exciting place either. It, my my sister, one of my sisters went to William and Mary, and um, Williamsburg is terrific, and Colonial Williamsburg is terrific. But you can only go there so many times before you say, "All right, I get it." If you go to, I live in the West Village now, which is a, a fantastic historic neighborhood in, in New York. Um, it is actually really interesting to walk by a row of federal townhomes, and then in the middle of the block there is a very sleek black steel building. Like that's or a glass building like that shouldn't be here. But having some bit of newness is very compelling, and having that juxtaposition to the order that your mind is programmed to see is exciting. You know, we you're primed to think about the next federal brick row home and not this black steel structure. So it is it is very interesting, and it, it provides an intrigue and stimulation which our brains require. Um, but it, it's a balance, right? And I, I think. America has had a difficult time of this because so many communities, um, Oklahoma City developed a little bit before um, widespread automobile ownership, but on the whole, it's a post automobile city. And same with a lot of cities as you go across the country towards the West Coast, you might have these historic cores, but on the whole, they are entirely car dependent. Um, and so you get only new, you don't have a culture that you're you're sticking on to or it's, it's perceived as uh, some sort of novelty like Colonial Williamsburg is. Um, and then you have the historic places that don't embrace any of the new. So it's, I think you need both. The difficulty is that so much of the new that we've gotten has not been good and has not been built to last. Uh, so we have this very strange association with what that is and what it, what it should look like. Um, yeah, I, a, a lot to go from there, but uh, yeah. it's a, it's a tough, it's a very tough thing. It is. It is funny you mentioned the kind of like black steel and glass building in the middle of all these federal townhomes. It's surprise. I, I will say I'm. I think I, I. Well, you. You know, you you train as an urban planner, um, right? Um, and a lot of my friends and people I'm with, and I mean, I, I are from Notre Dame and colleagues and stuff. And I love Notre Dame. Best, in my opinion, best architecture school in the country. The people that come out of it are incredibly well educated across they combine urbanism and architecture their work yeah. doesn't lie i would have yeah. to agree if you look at the quality of the work from notre oh. dame graduates it's just exceptional it's stunning and they, they they don't even touch a computer for their first four years um yeah but they uh you know they're very heavy on the classical side because they're teaching classicism and i'm not i'm not critiquing that anyway 
I'm just saying I do not have that background of I didn't study classical architecture. I kind of frankly learned what I would call a more vernacular building styles. I literally right. learned how to lay bricks with my hands. In order to design and build the house, I needed to be very simple. So I kept it very simple. And that is a rectangle. And then I kept, you know, just stayed within the limitations of brick and turned out, oh, that's kind of beautiful. <laughs> and then I've, I've, I've developed my design senses, but they're not hyper classical. They're just kind of this kind of more like, uh, I, not lower level in a bad way. They're just not as um, refined. Um, no way. But I'm becoming more open to, I would have used to, like the, um, the, the building in New York, uh, ground zero where the, uh, the, the Oc what did they call it? The Oculus? Yeah, the uh, Oculus. The this yes. one, right? Yeah. Yes. So <laughs> when that first came out, I was really, really offended by that. <laughs> Very hoity-toity. Like, oh, how could they not respect everything around? And, and I'm actually, I'm not saying I've come around to say like, yes, that's great. I've never been there and seen it. But I'm coming around to actually being more open to that of exactly what you're saying of something that awakens us out of our stupor, our everyday stupor. Because even, yeah. even the... the, the uh, Federal townhomes are beautiful, right? Like over and over again, but but like sometimes just something to stop and catch our attention and notice. But exactly. I do worry about novelty to you know that concept is as just a sole value. But um, I don't know. It is interesting because we want we want that beauty. We want certain types of excitement. But the way we build in America, it's like let's just live horribly. Eight ninety percent of the time, you know, our neighborhoods are where we go and work, where we have to take our kids to school, where we have to go to the doctor, where we have to go shopping, all this pretty miserable just getting about, you know, especially if we're in Houston or whatever, even Oklahoma City. Uh, and, then, and then on a Friday night, we're going to go to a dinner somewhere or we're going to go to a baseball game. We're going on vacation once a year. And that's like yeah. what makes life worth living. And I'm like, hell no. Like you think a few big moments of excitement, it's not the big things, it's all the little things. That's the magic and beauty of every day or like how I'm starting to think of things. And, and that's what I think the Dutch got really well is they kind of had this everyday beauty it's that's not right. about the big churches they've got a few big churches but it's actually far less than paris and vienna and all that it's actually much smaller scale more gentle density and yeah. it's about the the everyday simple beauty seeing simple seeing beauty in the ordinary and like i wonder if we could get more to that as a society uh I yeah know, i kind I, of <laughs> No, I, I'm a thousand percent with you, and this may be boring to people to hear us all agree, but <laughs> it, it's uh, <clears throat> there's this notion which I you may you probably are familiar with from Leon Creer um, that it's um, I forget the precise name of the diagram, so I'll just explain it. Uh, I, I don't want to do injustice to him. Is you can have cities that are uh, all of these fabric buildings, background buildings, as planners would call them. And that might be rather boring. And you can have a city exclusively of monuments, and that would be overstimulating. But uh, you can have a mix of both. I think it's res in publica. I'm not positive, so I won't, I won't be quoted on that. But um, where you have this interweaving of really high-quality background buildings, but they're simple. They are just a box, 20 feet across, 30 feet up. They have some shutters on the windows. They've got uh, lintels and sills. <clears throat> Maybe they're going to have a an outline over the front door with a, a pediment. You don't even need it. Maybe they have a cornice. They, they probably do have some sort of cap to the building. They, they usually wouldn't have. It, it could just be a, um, a, a detailed maybe crenellation or, or some sort of detailing work at the top of the structure to cap it off. But they're very, very simple buildings. And uh, they're, they are homogenous in some ways, but that's okay because they pass in quick succession. You know, it's, this one isn't interesting. The next one will be. The next will be. And of course, they're beautiful. Um, so that if, if you're in Amsterdam or, or Utrecht or uh, Leiden or Harlem or any of these cities, they're, they're terrific. But uh, that, I think it's unsexy. But time and again, if you go to the best cities, they are really high quality fabric buildings that on their own are solid. You know, very solid building. You know, not going to write home to it. But you, you string 50 together, you string 10 blocks together, and you activate them with mixed use on the ground floor. Now, all of a sudden, that is the stage that sets the city. And it is in a vernacular. You know, I, I use vernacular and traditional uh, interchangeably. Yeah. So that, but that's the regional vernacular. And then it makes those monuments that much more special when you come upon them, right? It, it, so good. Uh, 
the, the Oculus in downtown um, it was designed by Santiago Calatrava, I think for a billion dollars over budget as well. So, you right, know, but, I, remember. I was very much critiquing that at the yeah, time yeah, too. Yeah, and now yeah, I'm kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah but, but the cost is. Uh, but now yeah. I want to see it. <laughs> now I'm like, I think I want to oh, see it. Oh, it is it looks actually one like of the be, most. It'd be like magical, right? To like be inside of it. Piece? It more than an art piece. It is. It is almost a, a contemporary cathedral to be wow. inside of it. And I, See, I, yeah. I, I'm not someone who's in awe. I, I, if architecture is good, no matter what style, I will appreciate it. Um, right. I think all that one needs to do to appreciate that building is to go walk inside of it. It is pristine. Now it costs a lot of money to maintain it, constantly sweeping and right. polishing. Yeah, and, you can make those arguments. <laughs> totally. Yeah. It, so that that that's very, but. You know, it's exceptional. I think in some respects, it may not even get the credit it deserves because it's overshadowed, uh, overshadowed rather by uh, One World Trade Center, the Freedom Tower. It's overshadowed by Trinity Church, which is across the street. There, there are all these large structures. I've, I've made it a point before in New York, and I'm not a New York exceptionalist. Like, there's a lot of real problems in New York City, and I'm not going to pound my chest and say we're the best place in the world, as, as a lot of people do. But one great thing about New York is that uh, and maybe it's a little bittersweet. I always walk with my head up here uh, to the detriment of others, perhaps, who are walking with me uh, or against me in the flow of traffic. And you could walk down a random side street and see what would be the most exceptional building in any other city. But in New York, that is the quality of the fabric. That's yeah. the vernacular. It, it's going to be a a ten st- or an eight story uh, cast iron facade in Soho that is remarkable. And people visit and they love Soho. But if you were to isolate that in another community, it would be heralded as a landmark, right? And that is just our vernacular. But there is sometimes because of the wealth of New York and because of the attitude of the city, it is a very egotistical city. And everyone's always trying to one up one another and show you do have this loss of um, this loss of, of monument as a focal point. I think maybe the best example is St. Patrick's Cathedral extraordinary one of one of humanity's great structures ever designed and you you would be forgiven for walking by it and and not knowing it was there because there are 500 story 500 foot tall towers you know, 50 story towers that's surrounded on all sides and so it can get lost uh long meandering way of saying like you have to be able to reconcile these fabric background buildings with the monument buildings you need both but if one overpowers the other you either get a place that's too boring or get a place that's too it's overstimulated that's a good i, I like that like in, it, there's a restraint like sometimes i'll call i think leon career might do this or I, I i'm sure i'm stealing this from someone i didn't make this up but they call it a yeah fabric buildings or background buildings and then punctuation you know right. it's the uh and i really like that it's kind of like it's, a, it's not meant to be the meal or the fabric or the whole sentence it's the punctuation that really ties it all together and makes everything sing it elevates the fabric the fabric elevates it you know and i think about there's a great example in oklahoma city and you're not gonna be able to imagine it but just imagine i mean you're not gonna know what i'm talking about but just imagine a, a really great cathedral that's actually quite impressive like as a cathedral that's been built um like i admire I, I don't like it's not necessarily my style but i admire it. it's beautiful but it's literally just surrounded by massive parking lots and then kind of a crappy one-story neighborhood on one and i said one story, it's just these tiny houses on seven thousand square foot lots and yeah. you're just like this it's like you put notre dame at the end of a cul-de-sac it means nothing at that point yeah um that context really really matters and, and you know you, you mentioned the 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 um having homogenous is actually okay and you mentioned this with tokyo too when you get the scale right um, and one of my favorite things that Arjun, I remember Arjun Anderson said, and it stuck with me, I repeat it a lot, but just because I used to say, yeah, cookie cutter's bad. And, and John's like, no, 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 cookie cutter isn't bad. It's everyone loves cookies. It's just that they're bad cookies. You, <laughs> you, need, to, you need to bake good cookies. And I was like, yeah, well, that totally yeah. makes sense because the greatest towns and cities and neighborhoods in the world have a lot of, homo- you know, homogenous stuff over and over again. Um, but they work because they're creating spaces. And then Tom, Thomas Dougherty, who, you know, you met. Yeah, did of you, course. Did y'all, where did y'all know? Did y'all meet at Ion or did you know each other I think then? I think we met at Ion, but we, uh, we'd been familiar with one another. I was a, likewise a great admirer of, of a lot of what he's written about and, and his work. Um, so, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so he's – so he actually – works with me in building culture. He, he free, does his own stuff too, but he's worked, he's worked on this project I was just telling you about. Yeah. And 
really, really, I, I love his perspective. But one of the things that he said that stuck with me is we want to make the scale to where if you put out a pod plant, it transforms the street. Or not transform, that's too strong of a word. Uh, it, uh, it, it benefits the street. And basically yeah. saying like at a certain, if you live in a suburban subdivision, you put a pot, out, you know, it's going to do nothing to yeah. make that more human. But you can imagine the streets where you kind of, they're kind of blank, but you just a little bit of human touch, each person kind of taking ownership of their little space. And whether that's a bench or whether that's a pot of plants or whether that's a sign, whether it's a storefront, whether it's a colorful front door, whether there's a shutters, whether it's a little sign standing up, you know, like, and suddenly you've got like, beauty and vibrancy and liveliness and ah yeah <laughs> yeah no i i'm thinking or uh, i'm reminded of a street very close to me just off of washington square park uh it's washington muse i believe is the name and they are one to two story buildings let's say two stories flat boxes basically stucco boxes which you don't really see in new york city there's some ornamentation with brickwork but they're remarkably simple it is one of the most popular streets in New York City because of the scale, one. Two, uh, there's cobblestone lane through it. It feels as though you've discovered a place that is is special and mysterious, right? And, and people are innately drawn to that. We don't like when places fully reveal themselves to us from the get-go. We, we, that process of exploration is very important. Um, yeah. But the, I, when you said, uh, and I think, I, th I think we had this conversation as well in Ion, but um, a just a potted plant uh, on that street, there might be one or two, you're instantly drawn to it because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it has really good foundations. And then beyond that, these are these, these punctuations, they're very small. Um, it's, it is incredible when, when you just get the, the simple things right, that's something as, as small as a pot of our notion of narratives and story places telling stories of themselves. You can con th those background buildings. That fabric is the story of a place. If you go to Amsterdam, the steep gables in the in the row homes that tells the story of the city. When they have the plinths at the top of the building that they use to you know, bring up the uh, uh, boxes to the top floor because they used to be warehouses and uh, they couldn't very well do that for uh, very narrow uh, building footplates that they had because the stairs were so steep. So they had to pull use a lever and pulley to bring the goods to the ceiling. Um, that's a story of a remarkably efficient, maybe ruthlessly efficient mercantile city um, that was uh, optimizing for uh, some very discrete outcomes that now today, most people walking by don't know that. They just say, wow, beautiful row homes on canals. This is great. That tells the story of the city in the same way that Santa Barbara, I, I, I've been telling this, this story recently. People may associate it as being a beautiful Spanish colonial city. Say, well, of course, California used to be a part of the Spanish Empire, and there's a lot of Mexican influence there and Latin American influence. Those buildings don't come from that at all. Those buildings in, in Santa Barbara, that is the definitive style of the city, was a totally and completely arbitrary decision made by a couple of civic boosters and architects in the uh post-war period, some were percolate post-World War I period, some were percolating a little bit before, who, um, when they were going on the grand tour uh, in Europe, as architects have done for several hundred years, um, and war broke out on the continent, they couldn't go to France, they couldn't go to Italy, they couldn't go to uh, Belgium or Germany, where, you know, these places were, were under war. One of the few places they could go was Spain, and particularly southern Spain. And when these tour, tourists, you know, capital T, grand tourists, went to Andalusia, they said, you know what? This actually reminds us of California's climate. It feels very similar. And these buildings are very beautiful. So why don't we just take these buildings from southern Spain and bring them back into, um, into Santa Barbara? And so they did. And the reason why that style st stuck um, and has become the vernacular of the city is there was a devastating earthquake in 1925 and a couple of buildings were designed in the style just before 1925. And those were some of the only buildings that remained after the earthquake. And so the rest of the community was convinced that the style, which was beautiful, yes, but also was resilient and was able to stand up to this, this natural disaster. Uh, it was enough to convince them that we should just adopt this as the style for our city. That was less than a hundred years ago that, that, or just around 100 years ago. But that is a place that we have such strong associations with of being a Spanish city. And it was completely contrived. So 
in this in that wow. way like it's and those are all background buildings there's, there's exceptional you know institutions and, and monuments that have been built there but they're background buildings and so i'm reminded of a lot of the work that you're doing and others are doing whether it's in edmond or in, in oklahoma city or, or broader more broadly in the state there seems to be this and I, you would have a much better sense of this this o oklahoma seems to be the nexus of masonry built um construction in the u.s at least at, to, to the quality point, that you yeah. guys are effectuating <laughs> and it seems as though this decision it's a discrete decision that you're saying we're going to build beautiful communities out of brick and that's going to be our story and uh -huh. maybe in 50 100 years we'll we'll ascribe something but it could be completely uh anodyne you know someone went to uh southern spain and they said i like that you know someone went to uh whatever place that i want to build a brick right whatever the story is and in 50 years edmund might be a santa barbara of it's its uh, own tradition yeah its own yeah. tradition and but it can come from hey that's good and there's reasons why we were going to do this because we want these buildings to last for 200 years or 500 years or a thousand years so it's not completely arbitrary there there are reasons that underpin it but you could have chosen to build in any other style with any other material but there is this concentration into it and that's part of the narrative that's being global so i think i think that's really really cool yeah, I, I love, you know, that, I had never heard that um, about Santa Barbara. That's, that's really interesting. And it, um, it, it reminds me of two things. It's, it's one, a public, the Pablo Picasso quote of, you know, good art is borrow, great art is steal. Like, yep. there's no shame in being like, that's really great. Hey, there's a lot of similarities in these two places. Let's take it and make it our own. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean copying of like, let's do it exactly. It's like, let's do this and then let's let it grow and, because that's what traditions are, you know, it's, there's these things we want to really like keep them in a box and say classical or traditional architecture is this thing over here. I just think it's a value system that yep. really evolves over time. That's this wonderful blend of a cultural expression um, that's always being tinkered with, you know, and, and maybe if you want to just, you know, call a certain style, a certain style and leave it, got, that's Gothic. Great. Well, what's the next thing after Gothic, you know, and, and what's that continual evolution? And, and it also reminds me of um, a lot of people think the idea of tradition is outdated. Like, oh, yeah. it's tradition. Oh, it's outdated. And I'm like, no, no, no. Tradition is proven innovation. Tradition is the things, the most innovative ideas that have actually worked over time and proven themselves. And so it's actually like the best of innovation uh, totally. in, in a lot of ways. And so like, why wouldn't we take that and build off? It doesn't mean that's the best that it's ever going to be. And I love how you get into fatalism and stuff. And I think that's kind of where I want to wrap it up because we'll just have to do another one after yeah. this later this year about, we'll talk about development and infill and small development because I think that'll be fun. But I want to finish this time today is just talking about that idea of the fatalism of just like, this is what we have. This is just what it's going to be. People are, and I don't mean developers being afraid to dream, but just like people. Um, and, and then you mentioned all the people in, Oklahoma City or Oklahoma doing brick. And it's like, yeah, I'm really hoping that this is the compelling alternative. Cause you talked about, you know, you, we talk, I talk about this a lot too. How do you change people's minds? You can talk to your blue in the face. You got to show people. That's right. But it's harder with architect. You can't be like, hey, just go to the Netherlands for two weeks and come back. And you, know, you can do that. And here internalize too. all and the we lessons. We can make it different. Yeah. yeah internalize all the lessons. <laughs> and by the way, I don't mean do it exactly like that because we are different and we're Oklahoma and we're the 21st century and we do have cars yeah. and we do have other things. So, and that's, yeah, like, uh, can you talk about how you think about um, that narrative of the fatalism versus choice, the fatalism yeah. versus like we, the, the best world that we can possibly create is ahead of us. All we have to do is decide to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's something that is, uh, I think difficult for people to internalize, not to say internalize twice after lessons in the Netherlands, but, it, but it's the right word to use here that, um, we sort of acquiesce to the status quo because people are removed from the process of building communities and construction. It, it's simple consumption without any of the inputs required to understand that consumption. And that's not a value judgment, but it's the same way as if, if you're not a farmer, it, as very few people are today, you don't really know where your food comes from. You don't, you don't really understand the industrialized processes that take corn from Iowa or Nebraska and get it onto your into your popcorn, right? Whatever the case may be. And so I think the fatalism is you see the world around you and you understand 
construction happens. But uh, you say, well, this is such a complex process. What can I do about it? The world is as it is. The best is behind us. We've already built so much. We have what we have. Um, nothing is going to change that. And that, I think, is a philosophy that only really is validated in societies that are structured as as North American ones are, Canadian and American, of our development patterns and land use codes, where it is so difficult to do anything. You, know, you, you do build as uh, you know, to a finished state. And as uh, Daniel Heritage, who's a fantastic urbanist writer, says, these places aren't built by a thousand hands. They're only built by one corporation who's in some far-flung office park or tower that you never see. And you might see corporations' name on the for sale signs, and they might put their name on their community. But but there's a community in quotations. It's not a real community. It's just a marketing shtick, right? That, uh, but you have no level of interaction with them. So you don't think you have any agency. And that you can't blame people for thinking that because that is the world as it's been presented to them in our highly industrialized consumption economy. Um, again, that's not a value judgment. That just is what it is. But if, um, if you step back a second and you say, just ask a couple of questions. Well, what was there before this house? What was there before that road? What was there before this community was here? And then you, you try to put the puzzle piece back together. So you disassemble and reassemble. You go, oh, our communities are a series of discrete choices that people made somewhere along the way. Every single brick that you see on, on the wall, every piece of uh, slate paver that you see on a sidewalk, or any, any bit of asphalt that you see was the result of human intervention. Might, might have been assisted with technology, but a human made the decision to do that. And we, uh, certainly as people in New York City, but I, I also would say for people who are, live in more rural areas as well, um, we spend a, a high majority of our lives, 95, 96% of the time, in areas that were shaped by human hands. And even if you're going out to the wilderness and you're totally subsumed by nature, you might be taking a trail. And so there has been human intervention on those trails, right? If you see a, a marker to tell you that you've walked uh, three miles in pristine wilderness, it's not so pristine. You know, there's park right. rangers who are making sure that you're safe. So, and, and that's not a bad thing, but it's just to say that anything that, that you perceive, almost everything that you perceive in the world is a result of human intervention. Even, uh, you know, rolling hills, they might have been cleared of, uh, of trees from, uh, from generations past. So that makes me very hopeful because if there are places that you, that you hate and you might be fatalist uh, around and say, well, what can I do? You can also look at your favorite places and say, um, well, this is terrific. Look what we can do. So it's, this, it's two sides of the same coin. And depending on your perspective in the world, you can look at it one or the other way. But there are two sides of it. And I think a lot of people have not even deceived, but, but they've never flipped it over because you've never questioned how our world gets to be. It's just that's someone else, some time else, some place else who's doing development to me or it's already been done and I just exist in that world. It is we do not live in an immutable reality. You can actively shape and shift anything you want to do, um, but it does require back to this larger narrative of culture, a cultural reset to say, if there's something we don't like, we can actually change it. It, it is not you know, written in stone and God didn't come down on, uh, and tell us that we, we can't do this. We can change anything we want. You don't like that eight lane highway, we actually can take it down. Yes, it's going to require some logistics. Yes, there's a lot of stakeholders we need to engage. Yes, there will probably be several thousand page reports where we pay consultants millions of dollars to do work that we would have otherwise known without having engaged them. Fine. Um, we can change that. But that is a cultural uh, shift that, that will be required for people to take a little bit more agency in, um, in their lives. Absolutely. Not. Yeah, it, it's funny because you hear that and you're like, my God. Taking down a, a an eight lane or a twenty lane highway literally just sounds impossible to everyone. And I'm like, you know how much easier that is than launching a rocket into space? Like, right? The 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 know how. I mean, the technology, all of it. Like, we have everything we need to knock down 
a 40 lane highway. It doesn't matter how big it is. Like that, there's not, it's not the matter of how, like physically how to do it. That That's worked out. The technology, it's just the will. It's just the belief that's to right. do it. Believing you can get to space doesn't get you to space. You got to invent the rocket. Like all this stuff really is just within our grasp, which is really interesting. I, I find it actually, I don't find that depressing. I find it quite hopeful, I think, because Same. it allows individuals like you and me to go out there and just make a difference. And that's why I, just, I also think, you know, the United, America is pretty great because like as crazy as things are and as terrible as some things are and you know I all not it's like man we can go out there tomorrow and just keep working on that better world that we're trying to build and there's a lot of other people out there trying to do it too and it'll be interesting to see what we can what we can accomplish you know like even yeah. when I think about like kind of our lifetimes because that's I, I kind of think about what I do in in in, in in this time scale of my entire life, because the problems that we're up against, you know, are just way bigger than our lifetimes. You know, yeah. like we're not going to die and be like, oh, great. The Oklahoma City's perfect now. And, and in fact, we wouldn't want it to be because we want the next people to take up the torch and keep, keep going with it. And that's something that I feel like it's, it's, it's kind of a new thing for me that I, I'm recognizing. And, and this is partly just from some personal things that have happened, but there's value in the process of just like fighting the good fight, trying to do something good and meaningful. Like, and I don't get me wrong, trying without ever succeeding, that would be very depressing. But like, just there's meaning in just waking up every day and doing that, you know, like, and then yeah. you do get the good outcomes, but it's actually not necessarily just about that outcome. It's about who you become in the process. And, and that's what I'm having to learn too, because a lot of times I get frustrated when people are in my way of what I want to do, and and I still get frustrated, to be clear. Um, but but like thinking of it more like that, it's kind of the cliche part of enjoying the journey and not just the end destination. But I guess in my mid 30s, I'm realizing that it's absolutely true. That's not just a, a cliche. That's actually wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> well, if we want to live good lives and meaningful lives and enjoy the day to day when we do are constantly getting roadblocks at every turn, but at the same time, when you get around the roadblocks, like real magic can happen. You know, you can see some amazing, truly wonderful products or projects and just things happen. Um, yeah. It's and stack one on top of the other. And over the series of the course of many years, it may not seem as though you're making much of a difference, but if one person does one and then two people come in and three and four and five, ultimately, there's no reason why we can't shape places that in a century, two centuries, five centuries, people look back with the same level of reverence and love as they do to a Paris or they do to yep. a Kyoto or wherever. And so it, it is, it, when you zoom into the micro level, the individual level, you have to be cognizant of that journey and you have to be okay with just being a cog in that broader machine. Um, but, you know, cause, cause if you try to scalp too much, maybe that machine stops working and i think we've we've had a broken machine for the last 80 years because we've forgotten what actually propels us but um i i totally agree broadly yeah and it's 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 just like you mentioned at the beginning uh oh, you know robert moses and things uh, not that many people messed everything up and i don't mean it's not blame because all <laughs> people are solving problems and they create new problems and you can't see 80 years into the future so i'm not really trying to throw like it's not like oh my gosh idiots or they're bad people I, you know everyone's trying to solve problems and they create new problems and some of those created really bad problems so that's what i mean it but it didn't take that many people to mess it all up yeah but that also means it doesn't take that many people to fix it like that's in right. a lot of ways it just takes a small group of people that are doing it over time you need to get cultural buy-in and all that so in that sense it takes more people but not like a small group of people can can boy they can they can you you can you can change the world all right. if you look at the the best you know contemporary um uh, development and i throw what you guys are doing into that lot is it's not many people but the impact you can have is so significant because great that we can talk and be friends and share ideas and, and and that's awesome but what about the 21 year old girl who's going to uh, school to be a pharmacist in indiana and she comes across some of your work and she's never met you and she goes god that's that's really good and maybe she does it in indianapolis maybe she's so captivated that she wants to move to to oklahoma city and uh and open up an interior design shop that that does work with that or she wants to be an architect or an engineer or something 
it is the there are unknown permutations and reverberations um from one good project uh yep. that are incredibly impactful and, and i really think that we've been we're, we're going to be into this golden age of great new infill we're standing on the shoulders of, of 40 years of work since seaside yep. effectively you know um but from there I, I think that the original new urbanists many of who, whom i've talked to i know you as well uh it's it's probably beyond what they could have expected in the 80s when people were afraid of of even building something that looked vaguely traditional to where I we know. are today is just you know incredible I, I i i'm so glad you brought like there has been a tremendous amount of progress made like yeah. in 40 years like you're saying i mean it really it's going to hypercharge now reading, too yeah. yeah yeah i mean i remember i was just reading about like everyone telling me like this is just y'all are insane this is going to fail so hard and then like 10 years later you've got the country's developers visiting, trying to figure out how to replicate it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, and now we're at a point in the national conversation that, you know, I when I was in planning school, I joke with people all the time that I, I I loved architecture school, but planning program architecture school, but people are like, all right, yeah, we get it, zoning, you know, Euclidean zoning, car dependency, whatever. Let, let's just go to the bar, and I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> you, you you guys don't get it. Like this is this is really impactful. Um, and now the fact that random people online who have nothing to these, these were planning students who were like, we get it. It's enough. People right. online who have nothing to do with the planning movement are internalizing these lessons. And I'm I'm never whenever someone outside of my circle says an urban planning term or let's missing say the, middle, missing middle or, or, or that they say coming. that that one's come out and they, they talk about concepts that are. You know, the genesis was in these very small groups that we talked through. And when that, let's say, goes big on TikTok or, or the average person is using it, I am shocked because I could barely get people who were urbanists to talk about with me this stuff, you know, a decade ago. And now, so, so you, you have to zoom out, you know, the, the micro level, you can get defeated, you can get worn down. You zoom out and see just how far we've come in 40 years, 30 years, 20, 10, even in a year. And then you project that forward, and it's so many reasons to be hopeful. It really is. Yeah, it got me. I'm got me excited. So, <laughs> um, I want to end on just a few some some rapid fire questions for fun, um, kind of on different random different topics. Um, do you have any habits or routines that are really important to you? They could be new habits you're trying out, old ones. I'm not not specific in any way. I uh, I try to get to the gym. As as frequently as I can. I yep. living in New York, I do get a lot of active transport exercise. So if I just right. walk walking, a couple of blocks, yeah, you got I'm your ten thousand steps a day. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I'm shooting for you know if I only get ten thousand, like oh that's if I ever really? slip under oh. now my average is going to be under. It, it's it's I know it, it's it's a great privilege. Uh, that is. But it's uh, I you know I, I I know there are a lot of people who have who are very routine oriented, and I would like to be one of those people. I'm not. You know, yeah, I I, oh. I try to get to the gym when I can. I try to read every day quite a bit if I can. Uh, but oh, I'm that's what, those are two big things. Yeah, I mean, working out and reading. You know, I mean, those are. But but yeah. it's it's not structured at all. I know right. there are people that you hear. I wake up at five o'clock every single morning. I do this, that, and the third, and and every moment of my day is highly programmed. That's certainly not the case uh, in my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um. Do you have a top podcast you listen to? It doesn't have to be urban related to architecture, urbanism at all. Yeah, I uh, I have many urbanists and, and planning and architecture podcasts I listen to. I love them all equally. I won't elevate one over the others. Uh, so I'll just say I I am a huge basketball fan. I, I play college basketball. I oh. adore the sport. Practically everyone in my family played basketball at some level, college, professional, wh whatever it might be. We're, we're a very big family. Uh, and so we, we kind of, uh, uh, tall and large family, many, many people. Um, so we had no choice, but, uh, yeah, I, I love, I love listening to the Knicks podcast, national NBA podcasts. Uh, it's, that's kind of how I, I tune out. Where'd you play ball? In? Where'd you go to school? Uh, I, I started at NYU and then I okay. transferred down to Virginia and I, um, I was, it's a much longer story. It's a very interesting story. Um, was was considering walking on to the team my coaches were talking coaches at virginia and through a series of events uh ultimately uh didn't and it was a great decision to just be able to be a, a student for a couple of years and architecture wow. 
was not like, hey, I'm going down to school and partying. It was you're in the studio almost every day of the week and you're working in the studio almost every hour. So, but, but I loved it. That's, that's, that's awesome. How tall are you? Uh, well, depending on shoes and depending on, uh, <laughs> you know, but I, six, four, six, five. Okay. Six, four, five. Yeah. yeah I yeah. can't tell sitting here. I'm like, it's tough. Yeah. But if you played, yeah, if you play college ball, I figured you couldn't be five ten like I am. Um, <laughs> do you have any books that have changed the way you think or act in the world? And if it's helpful, last time I did it, it well, does something come to mind when I say that? Because I can give you an yeah. example. Okay, cool. The, the, well, this is specific with the built environment, but okay. there are other, uh, let's say... And I'd be curious about other ones too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like psychology, self-help, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, philosophy. Uh, Welcome to Your World by Sarah Williams Goldhagen is terrific. I recommend it to as many people as I can because most people who get into the urbanism discussions and built conversations around the built environment you'll read Jane Jacobs, you'll, you'll read um, uh, Power Broker, you know, you, you'll read all these seminal texts, right? You read Jeff Speck, you'll read. So right, Jan Gell and all. Yeah, Jan Gell, suburban. right. right. And, they, and they're all and suburban nation, right? Read them all. They're all terrific. They are as good as what people say. And, and maybe some of the lessons seem uh, a little dated. But you have to remember that they were such fresh and innovative concepts at the time that right. um, that fact that we take it for granted is a, a massive win for our movement. Um, but this uh, Welcome to Your World is about how the built environment um, impacts you at a cognitive and a psychological level. And so it has been the most informative book. A lot of concepts that I talk about, like stigmataxis, is our tendency to hug walls. So if, mm -hmm. if you go to a restaurant, you don't sit in the middle of the restaurant. You like to be in the booth with your back to the wall and to see everything in front of you. It's the reason why that's comfortable to everyone. And I'm sure every, anyone who's listening to this says, yeah, when I go to the diner, I like to sit in the back. And the, well, it's because we have a primal response to protect our back and make sure nothing's yeah. going to come from behind us and we can survey everything in front. And cities that are oriented the same way with narrower streets, with terminating sight lines that give us a sense of enclosure um, are really terrific. And so there, there's a lot of little morsels like that in in Gold Higgins' book that I couldn't recommend more highly. Awesome. I wrote that one down because I have not read that one, read all the other ones you, you mentioned. You, you said Terrific. you had a couple outside of the, the urban. I'm just kind of curious. What, yeah. What is a couple that come to mind? So I, uh, it's, I've always been interested in the idea of philosophy or, or the, the school of philosophy. Um, I took a couple classes in college, but let me tell you that waking up at nine in the morning on uh, a Monday to uh, talk about uh, you know, the existentialism and the reasons for why we exist and the meaning of life. I think the name of the course was the meaning of life uh, does not necessarily uh, induce one to become a philosopher. Uh, if anything, it pushes you away. So I, I had I had some, you know, college philosophy that that I was really interested in. Um, but th there are certainly a number of thinkers. Um, that 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 I've been interested in. Um, it's I'm I'm not an existentialist. I, 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 I so Camus not super interesting to me. Uh, Hegel is incomprehensible in, in some ways. Like, there's a lot of thinkers that are uh, difficult. I know it's been the, the Stoic tradition has been very popular in recent years. Ryan Holiday has, has sort of right. um, seen a resurgence of that. But I I like to read a lot of uh, 19th century uh, philosophy and and particularly because there's a lot of questions that are dealing with the concept of modernity. So you see this, this significant shift in um, how people perceive the world because of the Industrial Revolution. Of course, in the 18th century, you're having these sorts of questions as well, but you're really battling this um, in, let's say, from 1850 to 1920. And so there are a, a number of philosophers, economists, um, uh, public intellectuals that were writing and thinking in that era um that i that I'll, I'll go back and and then just one for modern audiences because those are very difficult to get through if you read uh very popular again today uh resurging um henry george uh you know the theory yeah. of georgism i progress and poverty is an important text but it is not one that most people will be able to get through uh it is very difficult read um it is, and I don't say people won't be able to get through because they couldn't comprehend it. Because you're going to read five pages and not want to read a sixth. Right. Um, the last one of this long and sprawling list is um, 
Alanda Botton is a, a terrific um, what is contemporary. Alanda Botton is a philosopher. He, yeah, if you've ever heard of the School of Life, uh, ah. they have a YouTube channel, which is interesting, but he's written a number of just exceptional books. Architecture of Happiness is a stunningly beautiful work of prose. Um, and he has uh, any number of, of similar, um, well, not similarly well written uh, books on a wide range of very interesting awesome. topics. So, highly recommend. Uh, thanks. I'm excited to check those out. Yeah. Um, Sorry, that was a couple... little sprawling. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. That's why I like these things. You get, you know, human answers out of stuff. It's not yeah. just uh, regurgitating um, something. Um, is there any, you know, it sounds like you traveled. Has there been a, a certain trip that particularly inspired you or something that's happened that particularly inspired you? Now, you, you know, you could just be like, I went to Spain and I loved it. Um, but you could also be like, I had this experience here at this one restaurant and that opened my eyes, you know, just something, something that kind of shaped who you are a little bit and how you think while you were out traveling. Yeah. I, I think at a more local level, my mom's family is from outside of Philadelphia and very strong Philly roots. Uh, Philly is a terrific city for those who appreciate it for what it is. I think if, if you're not from Philly or don't have family from there, it might be a difficult place to, uh, to really understand. But um, there, there are neighborhoods there that are amongst the best in America. And they all the things that we've talked about, you know, on this podcast so far have been, um, it's distilled in Philadelphia. And the city doesn't get a, a fair shake. Uh, and fairly enough, like it's, it's a tough town. You know, people are very tricky there. Uh, and I can say that because my family is, you know, in many respects, and I love them dearly. but that was incredibly instructive uh, from a design and urban um, planning perspective. And then I think internationally, I, I haven't traveled as, as much as I perhaps would have liked to. Um, but when you first go to London or Paris or Amsterdam or was able to go to Copenhagen, I didn't study abroad. So these were not study abroad locations. It's been over the course of the last decade that I've knocked one or two off of the list. You realize sort of some of the stuff that we've talked about um, just from an observational level, how powerful uh, the built environment can be in uh, really guiding one to live in a certain way. Um, and may maybe, yeah, Paris is, is the penult or the, the best example of that because I haven't been to Barcelona, but I imagine it'd be very similar. But that was the vision of largely a, a small group of people. How Baron Hussman, um, you know, most prominently. But it is a great example of, uh, you know, Paris is, I think people would say, is the most beautiful city in the world. Uh, that was entirely contrived. There, you, we could create Paris like this. Maybe not some of the monuments, but we have right. all the plans. We know yeah. exactly what materials they used. Hausman was meticulous in every detail of how we planned out the city. Uh, oh. We could literally recreate Paris. Um, you might not have the same institutions and vibrancy, whatever, but the core building blocks, easy. They, like we just copy and paste it. Um, so I, I think that was very illustri illustrative uh, yeah. for me to see. I've never been to Philadelphia, but Tom, you know, cause he lives in Westchester right outside. And I, I really want to get up there and visit him to visit that in Philadelphia. Cause one of the streets, he always, <clears throat> cause we give presentations a good bit together, you know, maybe to a client or something. He's got this yeah. acorn street in Philadelphia. He's like, what's the most photographed street in America? Acorn Street, and it's not a street. It's just this tiny alley with these row homes and trees down the center of, or like even just on the side. Yeah, and you're like, what? But it's we, beautiful, you know. Like we, I'm like, I want to walk those streets. We were actually talking about this uh, the other week. Maybe it was at Ion, or maybe afterwards. Um, my favorite street in America is in this neighborhood called Washington Square West, which is Center City, Philly, and it is a subdivision of a subdivision. So William Penn, uh, I think it was Thomas Holmes platted out the city, but it was, you know, Penn, uh, he was a surveyor, Penn planned the city. Um, and so you had these main east-west ar arterials and you had in broad strokes, these streets, but then um, a lot of this interblock urbanism that Tom talks, talks about is, um, was enabled where you could just take a parcel and subdivide it and build streets. And so you almost have this Russian doll of an alley within an alley within, you know, a broader right. street pattern. And it's called uh, Irving Place um, Irving between Place. Quince and, and Jeff's up, I believe. Pull up. Terrific. It is, um, I think the right of way from building face to building face is like 
16 feet. The building yeah. two or three stories tall. It's it has cobbles in the ground. It, it, there's trees as well. It's just extraordinary. Oh, that's awesome. Sounds lovely. <laughs> um, just want to end on, you know, so we've got, gosh, in, in 2024, the world seems like a pretty crazy place. You know, you got, you got wars in Israel and Ukraine and other possible wars, and you've got yeah. presidential elections, and we've got water problems and energy problems and health problems and mental um, health problems and, and, and violence and income inequality and built in, yeah. you know, climate change. Why are you optimistic and not just 2024, but 2024 and, and beyond? Uh, it's such a, a, a good question, a tough question, because there's every reason to acquiesce to uh, cynicism and fatalism and says that we can't do anything about these problems. They're too large. Um, I think for, for lovers of history or students of history, um, challenge is, challenges are, are not unknown or uncommon um, to humanity. We face many challenges in the past. And so far, you know, with not necessarily sterling marks, we've been able to rise to the occasion. And so I think if you were purely rational, you would, you would say, well, look, we've had great challenges in the past before. There's been wars before. Uh, and on many uh, metrics and in many respects, it is as good for the average person in the world it is as good to live today as it has ever been for them in history. There are always edge cases. You can always say, well, my aunt is, has cancer and my, you know, my, the, my neighbor down the block, her, her daughter was just hit by a car. And yes, there are terrible things that happen every single day. But if you zoom out and you look at rates of global poverty, rates of uh, malnourishment, rates of, of nourishment generally and in, in, in hunger, um, rates of war have, have gone up a little bit, but on a, uh, if you zoom out to the 200 year curve, they're very, very small. Um, from, so from a purely pragmatic perspective, if you look at all the large metrics that we should care about, um, we're doing pretty well. There are a lot of areas that we're struggling in. And I, again, I think it's just the, the most rational thing to do to say we've confronted these challenges in the past and we can do it again. Um, so that, that's one part of the answer. And the other part is, what sort of life is it to look at these challenges and give up and say, oh, you know, Climate change is a big issue, so I'm not going to have kids. I'm never going to leave my house. I am going to live in fear of, of any number of things. And that may well be a rational position to some people, and, and you can't blame someone for, for that, but it's, it's no way to live. So I, I'd much rather us find solutions to the problems that plague us than to, uh, to settle for what we have. Cool. Well, Kobe, thanks a ton for coming on. Let's do this again and I don't Absolutely. know, some few months and, and get to talk. I want to hear about your development uh, that you're, you're doing in San Diego. And I know you got 19 units from three to 12 units. And, and then just talking about fundraising and syndication and just being a small infill developer because it's really yeah. hard as we talked about. But it's also it's really glorious tough. and wonderful and so much fun. And I it couldn't do anything too. else. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah. well, um Thank you so much, Austin. I, I've really enjoyed this, man. And, and I, I, I appreciate you uh, letting me ramble a little bit on <laughs> certain, certain things here and there. <laughs> okay, well, talk to you soon. All righty, man. Thank you for listening. Really had a blast talking to Kobe. I will plan to have him on later again this year, talking more about development and some more technical things in that area. So please comment, send in your questions, let us know what you think. And please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.